Chapter Thirty Six of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baron Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Thirty Six. All in Vain. Pasco Pepperell staggered to his feet and at once felt pain in one ankle. Are you hurt, dear uncle? Again inquired Kate. Hurt? I have strained and bruised myself all over, my right arm, my leg. I can hobble only. Where's the trap? If you have no broken bones, uncle, sit down, and I will see after Diamond. The horse was browsing unconcernedly at no great distance. Too tired to run far, too hungry to heed his wounds, he had at once applied himself to the consumption of the sweet moorland grass. Happily the cart was uninjured. It had not been upset, and no more of the harness was broken than a strap at the head, the cob allowed Kate to approach and take him by the forelock without remonstrance. He knew Kate, who had been accustomed to fondle him, and who, in the absence of friends of her own order, had made one of the brute beast. She managed to fasten up the broken strap and replaced the headstall. Then she drew the horse along to where her uncle sat rubbing his leg and arm. It's the right arm, drat it, said Pasco. Won't I only give that cursed beast a leathering when I can use my arm again? Surely, uncle, poor Diamond was going on all right till you beat him. He is so patient that he did not deserve a beating. There is a thorn branch around which the whip has become entangled. I suppose that must have hurt him, poor fellow. He was good, too. When my foot slipped and I fell, he would not trample on me. You were beating him, uncle, and did not see where I was. Just think how good he was. Notwithstanding the thorns, yet he would not tread on me. Oh, yes. That's all you think about, you selfish minx. Your own self. Because you are uninjured, you don't care for me, who am bruised all over. It was no use pursuing the matter. Kate knew her uncle's unreasonable moods, so she changed the subject and asked, "'What is to be done now? "'Shall we go on along the moor or turn back?' "'It is of no use going along the moor now. "'We may come to some other darned accident with this vile brute. "'Lead him back along our tracks to the road. "'I don't want to be thrown out again. "'This is the second time he has treated me in this manner. "'If I had a gun, I'd shoot him.' "'Uncle,' That other occasion was no fault of his. You were driving the schoolmaster, and Walter Bramber told me about it. You set the wheel against a stone. Of course, the blame is mine, and this time also. The horse is innocent. If you had not beaten poor Diamond. Go on with the cart, and hold your tongue. But Pasco walked with pain. He had not taken many steps before he asked to be helped up into the trap. Kate led the horse and spoke caressingly to the brute, that was greatly fagged with the long journey without a break he had taken that evening. Usually he would be given an hour's rest and a feed at Ashburton, before the worst and most arduous portion of the journey was taken. But on this occasion he had been urged on at his fastest pace and never allowed to slacken it, and not given any rest, not even a mouthful of water at Ashburton. No wonder that he had tripped. Pasco looked sullenly before him at the girl walking in the moonlight, speaking to the horse. The chance of doing her an injury was past. He could with difficulty move his arm. If he drew his knife on her and attacked her there on the moor, she could run from him, and he would be unable to pursue her, owing to his sprained ankle. There was no help for it. He must make the best of the circumstances, threaten her if she showed an inclination to speak and compromise him. Perhaps, taken all in all, it was as well that his purpose had been frustrated. There was no telling. He might have got into difficulties had he killed her. In escaping from one danger, he might have precipitated himself into another. He saw now what he had not seen before. It had been his intention to attribute the fire to Jason Quarm. Had Kitty disappeared according to his purpose, then he would have said she had returned to Coombe with her father, it was known that she had left the place in his own company in the trap. She had been seen by the publican and by the miller. But it was possible, it was probable, 
that Jason had been seen as he drove through Coombe to the cellars. If so, then it would have been observed that he was alone. Accordingly his, Pasco's, story of her return with her father would have been refuted. Then, what explanation could he have given of her disappearance? Pepperell drew a long breath. He had been preserved from making a fatal mistake. He was glad now that his attempt on Kate had been frustrated. Then, again, a new idea entered his brain. Could he not have attributed her death to accident on the moor, had the horse trampled on her? He might have done so, but then, would not folks have thought there was something more than coincidence in the death, the same night, of father and daughter? I believe I'd have been a stupid if I'd have done it, said Pasco, and resigned himself to circumstances. Be us in the road? I reckon us be. Yes, uncle. Here is where we turned off from the highway. Which turn shall I take? On to Brimps, or back to Ashburton? On ahead, Brimps way. There's a little public house at Pound Gate, and I be that dry, and the cob, I reckon, be that lazy, we best turn in there and rest the night. The shaking of the cart hurts me, moreover. Kate got up into the vehicle and drove. Her uncle gladly resigned the reins to her, he could have held them, indeed, but not have used the whip, and Diamond would not go with him unless he used the whip. Before long the tavern was reached. A low building of moor stones, whitewashed, with a thatched roof, and a sign over the door. To the surprise of Pepperell, he saw a chase without horses outside. At the inn he drew up. The landlord came to the door and helped him to descend. What, hurt yourself, Mr. Pepperell? "'Yes. Had a spill. "'On your way to Brimps, I suppose. "'I hear you are selling the timber. "'Yes. To government. "'Have you visitors? "'Aye. Someone come after you. "'After me?' "'Notwithstanding his bad ankle, Pasco started back. "'Had his face not been in shadow, "'the landlord might have observed how pale he had become. "'What? Come from Coombe?' he asked in a faltering voice. "'Hardly that, master,' answered the landlord. "'Not likely that, when you be come from there. "'No, a course came t'other road. "'He asked about you at Brimps, and then drove on. "'He's purposing to sleep the night here, "'and was intending to push on to Coombe to-morrow. "'He's ordered some supper, "'and my old woman had done him a couple of rashers and some eggs. "'Have you a mind to join him?' "'But who is he?' What does he want? Pasco is still uneasy. A sort of lawyer chap. A lawyer? Pepperell hobbled to his trap. I'll push on. Thank ye. I'll not stay. Nay, you'd better. I hold with you, master, that it is best in general to give clear room to lawyers. But this time I don't think but you'd be safest come in. He'll do you no hurt, and maybe he brings you good, Mr. Pepperell. "'I'll go on,' said Pasco decidedly. "'I hate all lawyers as I do ravens.' "'Halloo! What is this?' A gentleman put his head out of the bar-parlour window, which was open. "'Who is it that hates lawyers? Not Mr. Pepperell?' Pasco attempted to scramble into his trap. "'Is that Mr. Pepperell, of Coombe Cellars? "'You must stay. I have a word to speak with you.' "'I won't stay. Not a minute.' I'll not charge you six and eight, yet it is something to your advantage. I'm Mr. James Squire, solicitor, Tavistock. I've come about your affairs. Your old uncle, Samson Blunt, is dead, died of a stroke, sudden, and you come in for everything. What say you now? Will you stay? Will you put up your horse? Will you come in and have some of my rasher and eggs? I'm drinking stout. What will you take? You won't drive any further tonight, I presume. Samson has died worth something like three thousand pounds, and every penny comes to you, except what government claims as pickings. Probate duty, you understand. Three thousand pounds? gasped Pasco. Aye, not a guinea under, and it may be more. His affairs haven't been properly looked into yet. I came off post-haste, 
took a chase from Tavistock, didn't think to meet you, was coming on to-morrow. An apoplectic stroke. No children, no one else to inherit but yourself, the only heir at law. Now, then, what do you say? Rum and milk, they tell me, is the more tipple, but I go in for stout. With glazed eyes and open mouth stood Pasco Pepperell, his hands fallen at his side. He seemed as though he had been paralyzed. Three thousand five hundred. There's no saying, continued Mr. Squire through the window. Look sharp. Come in, or the rashers and eggs will be cold. I asked for a chop. Couldn't have it. Pleaded for a steak. No good. No butchers on the moor. So ham and eggs, and ham salt as brine. Never mind. Drink more. Come in. Then the head of the lawyer disappeared behind the blind, and the click of his knife and fork was audible. Pasco tried to raise his right arm, failed, then he clapped his left hand to his brow. Good heavens, he almost shouted. I've done it all for naught. Done what? asked the innkeeper. Pasco recovered himself. Nothing. I am stunned. This has turned my head. Lend me your arm. I must go in. No, I must return home. Get me another horse. I cannot stay. Quick, I must return. Oh, be quick. Why, that's curious, said the landlord. I reckon you ought to go in and listen to what the lawyer has to say first. As for horses, I don't keep them, and the lawyer's post-horses be gone into the stable for the night. Lend me your arm, said Pepperell. I don't know right what I'm about. This has come on me quite unexpected. I wish three thousand pounds had come unexpected on me, replied the host. Pasco entered the room where the lawyer was eating. That's right, said the latter. Take a snack. There's some for all, I say, with my rasher, and you may say so with your legacy, and give me a slice off your dish. Polly, a plate and knife and fork for the gentleman. Pepperell seated himself. He was as if stupefied. Then he put both elbows on the table, though the movement of his right arm pained him, and began to cry. "'That's what I like,' said the lawyer. "'Feeling, sentiment, that's what we all ought to do. Amen. When grieving is done, there's a couple of eggs left. But I like that. Heart in the right place. Quite so. What is your tipple? That's very nice. Feeling, I love it. I didn't know, though.' that you had seen your uncle for twenty years, and cared twopence about him. Perhaps you didn't in times gone by. Now, of course, it's different with three thousand pounds. I respect your emotion. I love it. But cry when you go to bed. Eat now. There is a place, and there is a time for everything. It does you credit. I shall make a point of mentioning it. No extra charge. End of chapter 36